when I'm working with clients for the first time, the things we really focus on are one, what are you looking for? Two, where are you looking for it? Three, when do you need to move? Because, you know, different options, both on what properties are available to you, as well as what lending options that you'll get into here in a minute are available to you. If you're a first time home buyer considering getting a home, whether in two weeks or two years, today we're gonna to talk about four different factors you need to plan for when you're preparing to buy your first home and the steps that you need to take in order to actually get ready to buy. Today, I'm here with Mike Hutchinson, who is a expert lender, who's gonna be sharing and breaking down what those different factors are and giving you everything that you need to know in order to get prepared to buy your first house. Thanks for coming on, Mike. <laughs> Thanks for inviting me, Lucas. So uh, if you could give a little bit of background about yourself and kind of how you got into lending and what you do now, I think everybody would, would get some value from that. Yeah. So I'm originally from West Virginia, moved into North Carolina. Um, I started off my big business career at Microsoft. So I was at Microsoft for 20 years, um, did some of the technicals, some of the sales, some of the management and leadership. Um, and decided to go ahead and, and retire. I have a, a background in accounting and finance and a friend of mine uh, introduced me into the lending world, into mortgages, and it felt like something that would be really rewarding to really help get a family into a new house or help a family to save some money on their on their day-to-day -day life. It felt very impactful. So I decided to jump into the business, uh, kind of leverage some of my background and skills and try to help as many people as I can. Awesome. Awesome. I've had the pleasure of working with Mike's uh, a few different times and he's been an absolute uh, joy to work with and an awesome resource. Um, so for someone who is a first time home buyer and is maybe not sure quite where to start, hasn't been through the process before, where would they want to start? The, I would say the first thing that I would do is I would identify the right professionals. At the end of the day, you're going to need a good mortgage lender. And frankly, the first thing you need is a great realtor. Um, they're going to help you to identify a little bit more about what your needs are, where you should be looking and help you kind of frame the conversation before you come back to someone like me. hundred percent. And you know, when, when I'm working with clients for the first time, the things we really focus on are one, what are you looking for Two, where are you looking for it? Three, when do you need to move? Because, you know, different options, both on what properties are available to you, as well as what lending options that you'll get into here in a minute are available to you. Um, all, all important and all factors of what you can actually get into and um, what the entire experience is like. And also, uh, I always like to get people set up on home searches and show them what's out there uh, and really get clear on why you want to move. You know, do you need more space? Is your family growing? Do you just want to be in a different area so you don't have to commute as far? Like, what's the real reason why? So that when you're going through the process, you remember, you know, this is this is why this is important, and you can stay focused on the the goal that matters. So, and then also, um, you know, for part of that process on my side is also getting them connected with a really expert lender so that we can get all the money stuff figured out well in advance. Yeah, that's really important. And, and from a lending perspective, the, the earlier you can have a conversation with me, the better you'll be. And, and the reason I say that is um, I have customers reach out to me. Sometimes they'll reach out to me as they're coming to contract, but, but there's very little that I can do at that point to really improve your situation quickly. However, if you reach out to me months in advance or even a year or more in advance, then at the end of the day, I can help you better get yourself in a position for the home that you're discussing with Lucas or your realtor partner. Absolutely. And so who should be thinking about reaching out to a lender then? Cause you, you briefly touched on that, but, but who that's maybe watching right now really ought to be considering reaching out. Um, I, I would say anybody that that's considering either a first time home buy or alternatively, even a, a refinance, basically, if you're, if you're in a position to try to, um, to take that jump, then then you're probably a candidate to talk. And some of that's going to happen around potential life experience changes. So as an example, maybe you're getting married or you're going to have a family. Um, it could be around other things like um, uh, potential job change. Maybe your job is moving locations on office is closing down. A new one is starting up. Um, those are examples of times when you're going to start either a family formation or alternatively, uh, maybe a lifestyle change moving from the, the city to the burbs as an example. 100%. And also one of the things I also uh, encourage people to reach out about as well is, you know, if you, if you are already ready to go, 
you already have that pre-approval letter, then whether you are thinking about moving in a couple of days, you know, you, you don't want to be under contract and then be trying to figure out the money side of things. You don't want to, especially right now with how hot the market is, you don't want to be walking through your dream home and not already have the money side of things locked down because that's how you lose really good deals. And yeah, and, and there's, and there's two there's two phases of that, meaning um, there's a pre-qualification. So pre-qualification when you're getting into the lending side of the house basically means that someone like me has looked you over um, and given you a thumbs up, and that's great. And that works out most of the time, especially if you're dealing with a professional. However, there's a, something that's a little better than that. It's called pre-approval. And what some lenders will do is they can take you into underwriting in advance before uh, you actually go under contract. And then the power of that is that the underwriters in the lending world are kind of like the judge and the jury or the umpire in a baseball game. And they're calling the balls and the strikes for us. So what we do is we'll take you into the underwriting, make sure that we have a good firm approval. And then I can turn that back over to the realtor. And then the realtor has a cash like offer and you're in, you're in a much better position as you're going into your purchase process. And actually, that's a really good thing to, if you could real quick differentiate just for people that aren't as familiar, what's, what's the difference between you and underwriting? Yep. Yep. So, so I'm basically, um, a, a loan originator, loan officer. I'm the a branch manager for a company. And so what my job is, is to go ahead and identify customers that need help. And then I help kind of put together a file and do an analysis to say, Hey, you know what? You look like you're in good shape. Sometimes I'll be building a plan for the future. Sometimes I'll be doing, doing an assessment for the present. But when you get into the loan process, um, the partner and I, the customer and I partner together to put together all the necessary proof to the story about why you qualify for this house. And then we take that proof together to the underwriter and they verify that everything we've done is accurate and correct. And they give us the thumbs up and then you're ready to sit at the table. So you're, you're holding hands, if you will, with the, with the consumer, helping them get what they're looking for. And then underwriting is, you know, holding hands with the bank, so to speak, to, to make sure that the bank is protected and that they're um, actually getting into what they think they're getting into, basically. Yeah, it's a perfect, a perfect example, 100%. Cool, because I, I feel like a lot of people think of their lender as being, you know, like an advocate for the bank, which is not really, ac you know, it's not really accurate. But, um, you know, just like on the real estate side, we have compliance things, you have compliance things, but that's that's different from uh, advocating for a client. So, um, actually, going off of that though, so let's let's say that you know I'm I'm Lucas, the first time buyer, and I have kind of a vague idea I want to move in maybe two months, maybe two years, but I'm also not to the point of actually going out and looking at houses quite yet. Um, so maybe I'm not quite aware that I really ought to be talking to, to you, but you know, maybe I'm watching this video and realize that it is good to go ahead and, and connect with a lending professional early. What would you and then also that underwriter at the end of the day be looking for or looking at within my file to make sure that I'm prepared for that loan? And then also how would those different factors affect the end price that I'm going to pay? Yep. Uh, good question. So, so a few things. So we really look at, there's four big areas that we're going to cover. Okay. So the, the first for any borrower is identity. So we have to identify who you are, basically, who are we lending money to? And it's really a pretty simple process for most people. That's going to be things like uh, driver's licenses, and passports, and those kinds of things. Um, if you're a foreign national, there's some other things we might do. We might look at your ITIN or your visas or those kinds of things. But at the end of the day, if I'm lending money to Lucas, I need to know who Lucas is. Um, the second thing that's in that is really where you live. So we need to identify when we track that down that you've, where you've lived for the prior two years. And then collectively with that information, I can find out Lucas, who Lucas is and then who I'm lending to. Um, the second thing uh, when you really look at that will be credit. Now, this is one of those that is really important as to why you want to get to us early. Because credit really does two things for the borrower. So the first thing it does is it qualifies you for programs. So the higher the credit score, you can get into certain programs. An example might be to get into an FHA loan, you need a 580. To get into a USDA loan, you need a 640. And so as we enter into different programs, we need a different score to qualify. Um, the second thing that credit really does for you is the higher your credit, the better your rate. 
So at the end of the day, one of the things that a lot of lenders do, including us, is that I'll sit down and I'll look at you and give you a credit plan. And I'll say, hey, if you do these things, then we can improve our score from this to this. And that can be really, really meaningful. Um, uh, as an example, I was quoted with a customer recently. And, you know, when you looked at the lower credit score to the higher credit score that we could get them to, it could be as much as $350 a month. $350 a month in cost is really significant to most people. And so having a plan to build that in advance is really probably your best strategy. Um, and even if, even if you're, even if $350 maybe doesn't sound like a lot to someone, that's $4,000 a year. I, I don't know anyone, even people that make a lot more money than I've ever seen that don't think $4,000 is worth, you know, thinking about at least. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. Um, we, uh, we'll, we'll, when you look at it here, let me tell you a little bit about credit and break that down. So, so there are really five big things that go into your credit score. Some of those things we can affect drastically. So one of them is going to be your payment history. So everybody knows this part, pay your bills on time at the end of the day. And some bills actually are worse than others. You have to pay your mortgage and any of your federal debt, like student loans. So making sure you pay your bills on time is important. Okay. I, I won't be able to affect that much other than tell you to do it. Um, however, there are a couple of things that we can affect. So uh, new credit and credit mix are two things. So meaning how you're using your credit and how you're doing credit inquiries, I can encourage you on how to do that. But the two biggest things that usually affect people in this conversation is length of credit. And so what length of credit is, is how long you have had credit as it reports to the credit agencies. So uh, as an example with a credit card, have you had your longest credit card a year or have you had it 20 years? And there are techniques to help you fix that. An example of that is authorized user. So, so many people don't know that when you're an authorized user on a credit card, you actually take on the attributes of the card, good or bad. So the payment history has been paid on time, but also the length of credit and then how it's being used. So if by changing just that simple thing, you can take maybe a young borrower who's fresh out of college and maybe has two years of credit and instead help put them on their parents' credit card and maybe give them 20 years of credit and vastly change their credit history. The, um, the last thing I'd really do is look at percentage owed. And that's a common fallacy. People think you just have to owe less debt. That's not always true. There's techniques inside of that. And what I mean by that is um, we look at percent of credit utilization. So the rules I usually tell my customers are uh, if you're on a credit card, let's say you have a $1,000 limit. If you're using greater than 80% of that, bad. If you're using greater than 50% of that, better. If you're using less than 20%, best. So try to get yourself into utilization. And sometimes you don't have to pay those bills down. You can just peanut butter it across because you have three credit cards and one is bad and two are great. You can simply do a, a transfer of those funds from credit card one to credit card two. And you know what? Maybe they're all great without any money out of your pocket. Um, the second thing and that- Both of those are absolute golden nuggets that yeah. this is why I send, send people to professionals. Yeah. <laughs> and also going off what you said earlier about making sure that you make the payments. So what are some great strategies that, especially someone that maybe is less experienced with credit could use to make sure that they don't get late payments? And also what is a late payment? Yep. So as far as um, uh, a lender goes, so a late payment is anything greater than 30 days late. So once it hits the 30 day late mark, then it's late, even if you paid it um, after the fact. So, so all of those add up over time and each time you're 30 days late, that's one instance. And we just kind of add those up. We've had one late payment, three late payments, 10 late payments. The more late payments you have, the worse your scenario is. So one thing I always tell my customers is really just simply do auto pay and so get your bills set them on auto pay so that each month they pay and what i do personally as an example with my credit card is you know i want to know exactly how i'm paying it and i'm usually pretty good at doing it in, on time however just to make sure i'm safe i do my auto pay for my credit cards at a minimum number so i may pay 30 dollars a month on each credit card just so that they're paid on time and if I forget, I'm a few days late, that's fine. Then I can go in and pay the balance or set amount, whatever I'm choosing to do. So auto pay is a wonderful tool to help you make sure you don't make any mistakes. So you were about to get going on assets. What about assets? 
Yeah, assets is the next big thing. So, so anytime you're going to buy a house, basically in most scenarios, the creditor or the lender wants to know, you know, you have skin in the game. So basically you're not going to walk away. So because of that, there's different down payment percentages based on the program. Some of those are very generous. USDA and VA are two of those. So if you're a veteran, you can go 0% down. You know, the Veterans Association will back that up. But the other one is USDA. So USDA is basically a rural home. And you'd be surprised not all rural homes are actually rural, but they're classified as rural. And in a rural home, the government also will back you up and you can do a 0% down. So there's two great tricks. Um, and there's some tools. Basically, there's a, a lookup. And in order to qualify for the USDA home, you need to, uh, the property needs to qualify, meaning it's classified as a rule, and then you need to qualify, meaning your income is below the average medium for the area. Um, but and related more, to that, for anyone yeah. watching, I know of new construction within 30 minutes of city center, USDA qualified, give me a call, info in the description. <laughs> It's true. They're all out there. Uh, de definitely talk to a professional. We'll get there. Um, we, um, and then other programs will be anywhere from three, three and a half, five, ten, twenty percent 20% down, depending on what your particular need is. But at the end of the day, you're going to have to have some skin in the game, point one. And then the second thing that's going to come into closing is going to be what are your costs? So anytime you buy a home, there's vendors that you're going to use, whether it's pulling your credit report, whether it's paying your lender, whether it's having an attorney look for clear title so that you actually own the property. Um, there are different things that you'll have to do to save your money uh, in order to close. And and those can range. A typical is usually seven or $8,000 in closing costs. Um, and, but that can vary depending on if you want to do other strategies like points and other things. Yeah. If you want to spend more money on closing, you can, but well, sometimes it's good. Uh, and spending more money on closing is not always bad. So I'll give you an example. Um, what I do with my customers is uh, there's something called points. So I always tell them points are neither good nor bad. Uh, it's basically prepaid interest and it can go either way. So if the customer is really saying, hey, you know what, I'm going to be in this home forever. And the best thing for me is to reduce my monthly payment. Then there's an upfront cost you can do called points and maybe pay some more money upfront and you drop your monthly rate significantly. And then that helps you over time. And usually I'll talk to them about it in an ROI. So I'll say, Hey, if you do this, it'll take you, you gotta be there at least three years and, um, to break even on that. So don't refi, don't sell in three years. It's a good decision to buy those points. If you're going to do those things, it's a bad decision to buy those points, but points can go either way. So the second thing could be the customer comes to me and says, Hey, I don't have any money, right? I'm really short on funds. I need help. I can actually raise the interest rate and then give you money to help you close. Um, and that's a great situation where you're a first time home buyer, you need a little bit of help. And you know what, you think the economy is going to get much better in a year or two years and rates are going to drop and you're going to refi out. We're going to maybe have a credit plan, improve, improve your ability to, to, to get a cheaper rate. And that's fine. So maybe you play a few months of extra money on your, on your insurer, on your monthly payment, but you get a, you get at the end of the day, uh, the ability to begin in the home of your dreams. And you can refi out and get the rate that you need. 100%. And also on the new construction side in particular, there's lots of ways that we can get you a house that you like that has really good closing cost incentives. And the closing cost incentives to the builder are important because they uh, would much rather give you closing costs than discount the value of their inventory. Yep. And so, you know, I have one, I have one client that's closing next week who got $24,000 and change in closing costs. So she's, she's getting all her closing costs and then some, some points and stuff all covered. Um, and it's, it's all coming out of the builder's pocket. So at that point it's, you know, it's, it's free money to use to get the rate down. So you have a payment that you're really happy with. So, yep. um, so those are the first three. What is the last and one of the most important of those four factors, Mike. Yeah, this, this is the one that's always a little more complicated for customers. So a lot of people think when they come to me, um, when they're going to buy a house, it's what you make, how much do you make? And that's not what matters to me. My, what matters to me is how much do you keep? So it's called debt to income ratio or DTI. So what that basically means is uh, you make X amount of money gross, and then you have bills you have to pay. You have to pay your car payment, right? You have to pay the mortgage that you're going to sign up for. You have to pay your student debt. 
Uh, we care about those kind of things. I don't care about your gas bill. I don't care about your, your phone bill, but, I, but I, there's some bills I care about. So that's your debt to income ratio. So that debt to income ratio can either prevent you from buying the house or prevent you from getting into a program. And those vary. It could be anything from 43% to 57% in some instances. So, um, but we have to go ahead and take a look at that and then help you figure out the right strategy to maximize that so you can maximize your purchasing power. So Lucas, let me give you two quick examples on debt to income ratio and how getting with a lender in advance can really help you. So in one scenario, I was working with a trucker and when you do that, you have to choose to aggregate the incomes over 12 months. Or So I took his income and I averaged it out. And when I looked at it, he didn't qualify. So we built a plan about exactly how many hours he needed to work and how much money he needed to pull in. It took us six weeks to do it, but we were able to change his income and his debt to income ratio. And then he qualified for the home that he wanted. And it took a little bit of work and a little bit of planning, but you had to get to us in advance to do that. I'll give you a second example with a customer. Um, so a customer came to me in advance and we were looking at that same problem of debt to income ratio and they didn't qualify. Well, what they didn't know was they would have qualified just two months later. So we hung on to do it. And, and how did that happen? They had a car payment. So when I look at the car payments, they don't qualify. But because I knew that car payment was going to expire a year later, I could not count it two months later. So once you get to 10 months of debt remaining, I don't have to count that payment anymore. And that can all of a sudden take your five, your six, your $700 a month payment and remove it from your debt. And all of a sudden, it changes your picture and gets you into the into the loan you want and into the house you uh, house you love. One hundred percent, and that that affects too. I'm sure, not just what you can qualify for, but also you know the rate you end up getting and what you're paying for that money. Which you can you can help people figure that stuff out. Yeah, absolutely, because the, the numbers can can get a little bit overwhelming for sure. Yeah, but yeah. so for for someone, because uh, uh, I mean we've run into this before with clients. Um, what if someone is wrapping up their first their first home they're getting ready to buy their second you know get some more space for the family and uh, or maybe some warm weather if you're coming down from from up north uh what what is someone that is already has a mortgage on their their credit what did they need to do in order to, to plan for for getting a new home so there's a couple of strategies for that so it, it kind of depends on the scenario so so the, question, the first question I would come to the customer with is say, okay, are we trying to qualify and keeping both debt? So meaning we're going to sell house one after we buy after we buy house two. That's one strategy. And there's some strategies for that. It could be anything from how do I capture the equity in home one through like using a HELOC to draw some equity out, buy house two, and then when you sell it, clear your debt. That's kind of strategy one. Um, strategy two, when you're really thinking about that, is maybe you're planning uh, with your partner's how you're gonna be able to do both in succession. So how can I buy? Maybe have a little bit longer contract. Maybe you have a contingency on the contract so that debt one will be cleared before you get into debt two. But you have to get with both professionals, both your realtor to handle that, as well as to your lender to make sure that you qualify. And also to anyone that is in this situation, please, please, please reach out to a realtor early on that one because especially if you're moving from like another state or from another area, you know, and it's not one realtor that's managing everything. It's really helpful to be able to get you connected with the right people, both places. And, you know, not all markets are the same. If it's going to take you based off of the cat, like, because we have, at least I use tools with my clients of, I can give you an 87% chance that your house is going to sell within 32 days. Great. So if you're going to sell and it's going to take 32 days, but in the, the market you're buying in, you need to be able to close in 21. Well, that's a problem if you don't already have your house under contract or have, you know, a new construction builder that you can reserve with ahead of time to get more, more buffer there. Um, so for anyone that is dealing with that, please reach out early. We appreciate it. Everyone appreciates it. <laughs> what next steps should someone that is in the situation, they know they want to buy soon, they're figuring it out, they they might not know exactly what they're looking for, they might not know exactly what they can qualify for, what what are those next steps, um, especially on the, the lending side that someone should take? Yeah, it, well, so there's two big things that are important there. So 
with the realtor partner, you really need to figure out what, what you want, what's important to you. Is it the yard? Is it neighborhood? Is it bedrooms? Is it, there's some combination of that that you'll give on and some combinations of that you won't. But f you, oftentimes people come to me early because they need to ask that same question that you just alluded to, which is how much do I qualify for? Mm -hmm. And so you, I would engage now and then go ahead, put in an application. Uh, we can run soft credit pools so it doesn't affect your credit. But even if it does, we run a hard credit, a hard credit pull is usually three to four points. It's not very much. And when you look at how credit affects you, doing a credit plan to improve your credit, 20, 40, 60, 80 points is way different than the three or four points that it's gonna cost you. So at the end of the day, get a plan, get an analysis, get your budget, and then go out and, and search, right? And build that plan so that you can be successful. But I would engage now frankly, uh, if you're going to, if you're going to buy anywhere, even in the next year. And so what, just real quick, so someone can make an informed decision. What's the yeah. difference of, from the consumer's perspective, you know, if they're, if they're looking at getting a soft pull versus a hard pull, hard pull, you know, it sounds, even the name sounds kind of, kind of scary. Like what, what's the difference to them of what they actually get in exchange for soft pull where it's absolutely no downside. Yeah. Or a hard pull where it's like maybe three, four points that yeah. they could potentially get. Yeah, so, so there's a different level of credit checks that, that we get from the credit aggregator. So uh, a soft pull basically is giving me your credit score so that I knew Lucas's credit score is 720 or 740. Like credit card. Yeah, kind like of, but credit like card more card. sophisticated. Yeah, very, very simple. Um, but it gives me an idea what you qualify for. So I'm not really going to do credit repair off a, off a soft pull. But I can say you, you're eligible for program one or program two. And that way I could give you a budget and let you know a little bit about how you're going to work. Um, a hard pull is different. So what a hard pull is, is actually pulling all your debt. So I know every line that was open, every line that's been closed, what those payments are, what, if there's anything late, when they were late. And so I can get the details. But th that's really important. Even though it does take a couple of points off your credit score, at the end of the day, that's what lets me make a plan. So then I can look at this and say, hey, in order to make this better and take your score from you know 620 to 720, you need to do these five things. And this is what's gonna affect you individually. Because each credit is a little different and the tips and tricks that we would apply are a little bit different. So, so get, the, get it analyzed early and then, and then we can take a look. And so for, if someone is, let's say six months out, nine months out, 12 months out. Usually I feel like people, at least people that reach out to me, it's usually that kind of that six to nine months out. They're thinking about it. They're beginning to want to look at things, but they're not real, real serious yet for someone that reaches out of that six to nine month mark versus waiting until they're one or two months out from trying to buy a home. What's the difference in their options, especially on the credit side? Um, so because like, I, I, one of the questions I get all the time, especially yeah. when I'm referring referring people to you or, or anyone else is, yeah, but I'm, I'm, I don't need to get pre-approved yet. I don't need to get pre-qualified yet. Cause I'm not, I'm not planning on buying and, you know, for another six to nine months and I don't want the credit pull and blah, blah, blah. So like what's their benefit to getting that extra six, seven, eight months of lead time. So it really depends on the, on the customer. Uh, if you've already get, got an 800 credit score, then really all I'm going to do in that instance is I'm going to give you budget. Um, and I don't have to pull credit to do it. But if you're not an 800 credit score, at the end of the day, we're going to continue to improve your score and then we're going to in improve your price at the end of the day and build you a plan to get to where you want. Whether that plan is helping you to improve your DTI, or whether it's a plan to help you with your credit um, to continue to improve that, all that will help. Because even if you have good credit, so let's say you have 700 credit, it, it has a value to you financially to get from 700 to 760 building that plan really helps you save you money now and frankly for the next 30 years. And so is that achievable then for someone to be able to pick up as much as like 60 points in six, seven, eight months? Yeah. Oh, hundred uh, um, percent. There are the rare scenario where you can do things pretty quickly. Uh, that's usually someone that's young um, where maybe they have a, a very thin credit history and you can manipulate things quickly. Um, but anyone that, that is um, a little more mature, you know, has had a little bit of credit history, then those things take time to turn those ships. And so that uh, I would say the, the biggest credit change that I've done personally, I, I had a customer I changed. It took me about six months to do. 
but I changed them in the area of about 160 points. So you can drastically change your Insane. credit. That's that's yeah. wild. Yeah, with a good plan, Frank. It's all about the strategy and the execution yeah. and, and the right partners to, to do the right thing. So. so, Mike, what are the next steps that someone who is seeing this and thinking, you know, I'm, I, I know I want to buy some sometime in two, six, 12, 24 months. I'm not sure exactly where to start, especially first time home buyers. That's, that's a very common situation. Yeah. What are particularly on the lending side? What are, what are some of those first steps that someone should be taking? Uh, I would reach out and make a plan now. I, I mean, at the end of the day, um, to engage with a lender doesn't cost you any money until you sit at the closing table. The exception would be if we do a hard credit pool, then we would charge for that advance, basically whatever the, the service provider charges us. But the rest of the work, as far as building the plan, you know what, we don't get paid, lenders don't get paid until you sit at the table and, and sign the contract with the customer. Or until with you the, get keys. The house. That's right. So at the end of the day, we're motivated to get you in a better position so that you can buy the house that you want and close on time. So, so I would apply now, frankly, and then take a look. Uh, doesn't cost anything, and it will help you build your plan and be successful. So connect with a professional, get a plan together, and sure. then execute on that plan. Yeah. Yeah. And I know both both Mike and I are very happy to help you every step of the way between now and you know when you want to actually move into that house, whether that's in two weeks, two months, two years. So. What is the best way to get in touch with you, Mike? I appreciate all the time today. My cell phone, anyone can reach me my cell phone. My cell phone is 704-582-9549. That'll be my cell phone until the day I die. And so you're always welcome to text to call. I work pretty much 24 seven. So just reach out and then just cite this broadcast and, and Lucas and then um, I'll get with him and we'll connect together and, and uh, help build your plan. Sounds perfect. I appreciate the time. And it is true. Mike is awesome at communicating. That's one of the reasons why he has been an awesome partner to work with. So I uh, appreciate the time today, Mike, uh, as always. And to everyone watching, thanks for joining today. Until next time, as always, hope to show you around town.